We're talking about intercom and the idea of building a more resilient ecosystem through observability. Uh, and we'll kind of kill the music here. That's done. Though it is tempting to kind of have the music going the whole time like a radio show anyways. Uh, just a little bit of intros on what's happening today, who we are, and what we're doing. And we should see, there we go. Awesome. Thanks everyone for joining. Got a couple of folks on the call. Just to in introduce myself, uh, I'm Michael Wild. I go by Wild. I've uh, been with Honeycomb for um, quite some time now. Um, even though I have this uh, account executive title, sales guy title, most people who know me uh, know I'm a pretty technical person, use a product. Uh, and it's really a, a great pleasure to have Jessica Kerr and Kesha on today. Uh, maybe let's throw it over to Kesha, who's who works at Intercom. Kesha, where are you at in the world? What do you do for Intercom? What's Intercom for every people that uh, have not uh, talked to? A little intro would be, would be great. Yeah, great. Thank you. So I'm based in Dublin at the moment, and I've been working at Intercom for, oh, so about five years so far. And I've been in various different product teams, but at the moment for the last few years, I've been in infrastructure group. And I'm interested in various different distributed systems and databases and search indices, but uh, in particular, over the last few years, I've been interested in observability. So Intercom is, uh, is a great company, and our mission is basically to help businesses to communicate with their customers. So we would like to make business personal. So traditionally, you would you'd use emails or maybe phone or some other means to communicate with your customers, but it kind of hard to keep the context of those conversations. You don't really have a lot, a lot of information about your users. So what Intercom does is that we'll give you a, a nice messenger to put in your website and um, let your customers chat with you through that messenger. And as part of it, we give you a lot of context. So you know a lot about your customers when you chat with them. And on top of that, we have lo loads of different support and sales and marketing products to help your business to grow and, and be successful. But it's all about making business personal, basically. So, uh, yeah, we love uh, at Honeycomb. We're a customer of Intercom. We love it. It's uh, fantastic, and we use it in a number of areas. Either on our website, we've got some cool product tour stuff going on, and we think it's really, really amazing. Intercom wrote a book called Intercom Starting Up. If you happen to be um, interested in reading about startups and how Intercom did it, check that book out. It's awesome. Um, my good friend, Jessica Kerr, known as uh, Jessitron from Honeycomb, introduce yourself. Where are you at in the world? What's going on? What are you working on lately? And, and what are you excited about? Good morning, Michael and Kesha. I am in St. Louis and I have a bit of a cold today, so I might not talk as much as normal <laughs> as you can hear, but I'm very excited about uh, observability because uh, Kesha said Intercom helps business communicate with customers. At Honeycomb, we try to help your software communicate with you and let you have conversations about what's going on uh, with a lot of context. So there's some parallels there. I'm, I'm really excited about Kesha's story of bringing observability into Intercom and how it was like a very deliberate change to promote learning at Intercom. It wasn't easy, but it has been very rewarding from the sound of it. Thank you, Jessica. I will uh, do my best to uh, save your voice as much as I can. Uh, anyways, let's let's get rolling. Let's you know try to make this a webinar that people want to watch. Um, so, you know, in going with what Jess had talked about, you know, she's interested in learning more about um, intercom making the shift to observability, and I too am interested a little bit more you know, for Kesha to share some of that with, um, with the world. Um, maybe, you know, Kesha was kind of thinking, um, Intercom's obviously not a brand new company. It didn't start, you know, with, you know, practices from today, probably have some monitoring, APM, all sorts of stuff like that, you know, kind of maybe share with us a little bit about how you see observability, you know, when it, it, it hit an inflection point at intercom what made you want to move towards that direction anything else you'd like to share 
Yeah, so um, it started with a fairly simple question that my amazing colleague Hannah asked me, I think a year and a, uh, one year and a half ago. So the question was, so we have lots of different vendors for various different telemetry data types, observability vendors, and how much value do we actually get out of them, right? Um, they are not, uh, they're extremely expensive and uh, we really wanted to understand whether we get enough value uh, while using them. So we started looking into this and um, uh, quickly identified sort of a problem with the way we've been doing observability so far. So typical workflow would be, so say you get a, some page in alarm in one tool and you go there and you read the description of the alarm and then it says, oh, but we have a dashboard for this kind of a problem. And you go to a second tool to look at the dashboard and typically dashboard would be, and it's a good dashboard, you know, a like hundred charts. So you'd scroll down all of those charts, trying to figure out which specific thing correlates with which specific other thing, just trying to eyeball all of that stuff. And um, it was really hard uh, to, to do this kind of thing, but ultimately you wouldn't get any specific data around that specific issue that you were looking at. For example, you wouldn't be able to get a customer ID from all of those different metrics visualizations. So then you'd go to another tool to, get more insights, say logs, uh, and try to find some information about transactions and maybe some specific data points that you'd be interested in. And then maybe that wouldn't be enough. And then you go to some other tool to, to say exceptions tracking and see whether you can find something useful in there. So pretty quickly became obvious that those workflows are extremely inefficient because you have to hop through various different tools. So there's a lot of traction. And um, as a result, only a few folks like really mastered those tools. They were able to extract insights. They were really productive. And even for them, it took a certain amount of time. But for the majority of the product engineers, it was really hard. It's just completely overwhelming to master all of that and be productive. Um, and as a result, so we had those various different tools with telemetry data siloed in between those tools, and they were costly under setup because every single tool requires specific kind of setup. You have to spend some time with it to configure it properly. And more importantly, people were not happy with this. Uh, they were not able to, uh, to get the information they needed. And um, it was just really hard, that experience. So that's kind of the problem that we realized. And as ironic as it seems, um, you folks have been talking about this for like, I don't know, years. And we've been good friends and um, with Honeycomb. Uh, but it just it just um, takes some effort to actually see this problem as it happens versus just, yeah, we agree with you. We were not in our heads, but uh, we were not actually making that change, this um, kind of can we do better? Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, like one of the one of the things that, you know, in hearing you talk that um, from popping from tool to tool, um, just the you know, you, you have a slice of people who probably have proficiency going from one tool to the other, right? They're the experts or, you know, black belts in, in, in you know, in problem solving. But time seemed to be a theme that you kind of mentioned. Um, did inter Does Intercom actually measure that the time spent in debugging or most people do some mean time to resolve thing? Um, in, from engineering productivity, did, did you see that as a company and want to improve it? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think we have any specific uh, measurement measurements around this, but I, I just um, counted the number of um, different query languages that you'd have to learn to be productive with all of those tools. I think it's like seven, and three of those are different flavors of SQL kind of thing, and then you have some tool specific um, mm -hmm. uh, query languages. So most of the folks, they didn't even get to the end of this workflow. They were just um, given up uh, because it was too hard. But um, yeah, we haven't measured this specifically, but uh, it was a kind of a general understanding that they are extremely inefficient. Just like a feeling that, oh, here we go again. Or, you know, maybe folks are are either less happy. I wonder what, you know, in, in a situation that you described, like we've got a bunch of tools and I'll bet you the answer is somewhere in there, right? Not to say that, yeah. you know, you guys using Honeycomb has just saved the world, right? But I wonder what it's like for the folks that are on call though, 
because like product engineers, maybe they're on call. I don't know. Are they on call? Product engineers on the yep. on call team? Yep. But you've got SREs, right? Uh, no. So we, we have oh. an, an, an interest in system. So we have a, a office hours on call where every product team uh, has, has a person who's on call at this specific uh, week. But then it's only during office hours. And we have a separate team called Strike, which are it's based on uh, volunteer based and it's paid and those folks are taking the pager during outside of office hours that's interesting so so i'll bet there's a little bit more pressure on the person that's on call and having to become good at the current or the at you know debugging process at the time that that might be a little scary then again, maybe they're the experts, right? I don't know. Yeah, well, it, it's kind of, as you scale, it's really hard to just rely on a handful of folks who really master that stuff. And um, it's it's too high of an expectation for a regular product engineer to, um, to be productive with this many tools, especially when there's some sort of an incident. Um, yeah. It, yeah, you just can't figure this old stuff out under pressure. You have to consist like constantly continuously build this muscle memory of using all of those tools every single day and only then you have a chance to be successful uh whenever you have an actual issue and you're under pressure to uh to investigate it quickly Kesha, do you notice that like there's a few people that every that every issue has to fall back to one of them yeah that was uh very That's much a sign nice. yeah exactly when you have those observability champions and uh, almost any single, single time something breaks, ultimately you have to reach out to them because they know the systems inside out. They know all of those dashboards and how to eyeball the correlations with a uh, hundred hundred charts at the same time. And they know where to look for and which log line represents which failure mode. So um, yeah. It's like having superheroes when yeah. the goal is for everyone to be able to, to find out what's going on exactly it, it just doesn't scale and even even superheroes sometimes takes take day offs and holidays so i hope so yeah i don't know in 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 the movies they don't so yeah but the movie ends <laughs> oh that's right the movie, the movie does end um kesha wrote this really great uh blog post which i recommend that you check out um, it's on Intercom's website. There's a post on Honeycomb as well. I thought this is fantastic blog post. So Ooh, thank check you. out that dashboard. Yeah, well, there's a dashboard on there. But what the, just... the best thing about this, and this is the subject that I want to talk about right now, is you made a statement that about distributed tracing. So we're talking about distributed tracing. <laughs> Traces have a massive advantage over other telemetry data. They encode enough information about transactions to power virtually any visualization, building observability workflows on top of traces ensures a smooth consolidated experience without the need to switch the underlying data or tool. That's, that's an interesting observation. Um, let's talk a bit about tracing because in the, in the prior discussion, you know, when, when Hannah had came to you, it's like, is, is all this money we're spending or tools we're using really helping? Uh, you mentioned you had different data sources. What what about you know traces in your mind? Uh, kind of you know did it did it help you make a leap? Um, how did it change things the game for for you all at Intercom? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. I think um, when I start started looking into this, I kind of quickly realized that um, it doesn't really matter for well most of the time. It doesn't really matter what kind of data powers. Uh, your investigations. Folks don't think about this in terms of oh, metrics or logs or whatever traces. What they're really interested in, in is to be able to see different visualizations, understand what normal looks like, maybe see a deviation, maybe have different perspectives on the problem they have at hand. So um, the efficiency of those observability workflows really depends on how smooth the workflow is. Can you switch between multiple different visualizations easily and quickly without hopping through various different tools, without um, keeping what kind of telemetry powers which visualization? So 
Um, and traces is just that kind of telemetry that is so powerful. It encodes so much more information about the transactions that you don't, you don't have to switch tools. You don't have to switch data. You can use just one single data set and then um, seamlessly switch between different visualizations to get so those. Kasha, uh, yep. Thank you. What kind of questions can you answer with, with these different visualizations? Yeah, so it's um, just different uh, use cases. For example, if I'm, uh, if I'm interested in a certain signal and I want to understand how that signal changes over time, maybe I'd like to view my uh, seasonality of traffic or whatever that is. I, I'm interested in a time series, right? I just want to see this one single plotted on a chart and be able to reason about how it changes over time or under certain conditions. Or maybe I'm a bit more sophisticated uh, and I'd like to see the distribution in time, like the heat map and um, see maybe different modality of, of um, say, response time that I'm tracking. So I can see that there's significant population in the middle and maybe there's some fast request underneath and then some slow outliers. So it gives me an idea about the um, structure of the distribution. Or maybe I, I'm just trying to learn the system that I own. I just joined the team. I, don't, I know nothing about it. And I just want to understand what kind of components or um, different systems that go into processing a given request. And I open a trace view and uh, I look at those different units of work and uh, the hierarchical structure of that and maybe look at some attributes that describe those various different units of work. So um, there are different jobs, basically, or different workflows. Mm -hmm. And uh, for every workflow, there's kind of visualization that fits nicely. And with traces, you can sort of seamlessly switch between those without have to like go to a different tool or different data type. Let's take a pause for a second and ask the audience a little bit about distributed tracing. So if you are um, watching this in the recording, we'll talk about a little bit about uh, what the answers were. Uh, but please, if you would like, um, we've asked some questions here, just kind of generally about distributed tracing. Uh, and, and what you might know about it, what your experience might be. And I love the fact that there are some folks that are answering the first time learning about it question because we have, um, we've got an expert at distributed tracing here in Kesha, which, love is, them. which is great, right? Um, um, give ooh. it a, we'll give it a couple more, a uh, couple more ooh, ooh. Uh, seconds and, you know, we'll. And now we'll, I really want to ask Kesha about, um, in, in your blog post, you talked about helping developers understand how to work with distributed tracing by get them getting them to look at it locally in their local yep. environment. Can you talk about the difference between looking at logs and looking at a distributed trace? Uh, yeah, so um, the difference is stark. So um, if, you, if you have a like decent size of a web application and you... Um, have a specific request that you'd like to look into, uh, then if you open the log file, it's just a wall of text. Um, you can hardly um, find the information with your eyes. So you ha you'd have to like parse it and, and grab some stuff and, and see if you can find all of those log lines. And then when you do, you have maybe a hundred uh, of different log lines. And now you have to do the mental work of assembling them together to create this representation of your transaction of that request that you just processed, right? So you have to, um, yeah, it's, it's really hard. I mean, just looking at those texts, the text lines and uh, figuring out about the, the request that you've just- Oh, but when you can do it, it feels so powerful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And I well, can when it's just me and I sent exactly one request through. Yeah, uh, it, it is certainly possible. However, it just takes a lot of, brain power and why and would you heroism yeah and why would you like. do this if you can just yeah um oh sorry go ahead oh maybe a that bit of a delay awesome. yeah so um it just takes a lot of brain power and um it's much easier to open up a trace uh, for that specific request produced locally but i guess there's also the um kind of another benefit of having tracing produced from the local environment is that it helps you build this muscle memory without being under pressure. So you haven't even pushed anything to production yet, but you already can see the way instrumentation will, will look like in when you push your new change to production. And um, you use the same tooling 
so you're kind of learning how to run those queries and how to ask questions about production and ultimately reason about the code that you're writing at the moment in the local environment. So um, yeah, it kind of serves um, many purposes. And one of them is getting familiar with the tool and getting familiar with the instrumentation uh, uh, and ultimately be more productive when you actually push something to production. Yeah, love that. Like how, when you, you know, let's, let's say when an engineer at intercom drills into a trace, like, you know, are they, are, are your traces super long? Are they easy to read? How do they, you know, how do they take a look at it and what kind of things draw their, draw their attention? Um, yeah. So, um, our traces are different in terms of the number of spans they have. And, um, it is kind of a problem because you, you don't want to have a trace that is too big up to a point that it's really hard to just, uh, look through that trace. You have to scroll down, um, for a long time. So you have to find that balance where your traces are, um, kind of concise enough to, um, to be able to, um, consumed by a human, yeah. but also makes sense out of it. Right. Yeah. yeah. But also detailed enough to give you enough information about the, um, um, that request or maybe a background job that you've just processed. But by the way, that, that slide that you show in right now, mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting one. So we, 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 we spoke, we mentioned a lot of distributed tracing, right. And typically you think that, um, and rightfully so the distributed tracing is, um, a great, um, way to um, kind of reason about your microservices architecture, maybe when you have many different services connected through the network together, and then you can't have logs in the same place. So then naturally distributed tracing comes in mind and you kind of solve that problem. But uh, interesting enough, we, we don't use distributed aspect of tracing at Intercom. So our application mm -hmm. is a massive monolith. So it's a Ruby on Rails application. And um, we, we do have some side, side uh, applications on the site, but majority of the product is concentrated with, within one single monolith, which we're proud of. We love it. We invest a lot in it. Uh, however, and you might ask the question, well, but why would you need distributed tracing, right? If you don't have any kind of microservices and anything like that. Uh, so this trace is an interesting one because it's a, it's a web request where uh, I think 14 different uh, product teams own the code that, that processes different parts of that request. So already you can see that the complexity of the, um, of the code that process this request overall is, is high. So, um, and even though it's processed by one single monolithic application, it, this complexity requires tracing to be able to understand what's going on. Like if something broke, which team is responsible for that part of the application or which service was that? And if something is slow, again, you kind of ask the same question. So um, the part that I like about tracing is it's not just about distributed kind of mm -hmm. architecture. It works really nice for the monolithic ones. And um, our app is a, is a good example of that. Yeah, I think someone probably, the distributed part is you could say like an important word for people who have distributed services, but perhaps there's, you know, some other cool term for tracing within, you know, as in a monolith, as you talk about, um, uh, Kesha, but, you know, I, I did this poll of, uh, five minutes ago and it was interesting that like 26% of the people, this is the first time they're learning about tracing, right? So hearing that the distributed nature of distributed services is something great for tracing. And also, you know, that monolithic, in environment and we kind of use monolith as sometimes we use monolith as a negative term but it's not it's like this is the way our app works and it works for us um five percent of them are have been using zipkin and jaeger 58 percent are implementing open telemetry and then 11 percent said tracing is my life um as far as tracing at intercom uh how do you uh, what do you use for instrumentation um, are you an open telemetry shop? You doing some older Zipkin Jaeger things? Something different? Yeah. So we we do use open telemetry for um, for our front end application and some of the side applications as well. But for the monolith, we ended up using um, so we had DD Trace, uh, which mm -hmm. is a 
Ruby um, library already in the um, code base for a long time. We had it for a long time. And we kind of just hacked it together so that um, whatever telemetry it produces, we convert it into the honeycomb format and then just send it over through refinery. So we don't use open telemetry in the monolith um, on the back end, but we do on the front end. Gotcha. And you also said something about refinery. Yes. Well, we got people here that are having first time learning about tracing. What is refinery? Yeah, so, well, I guess before we uh, talk about refinery, the important yeah. aspect of uh, tracing and, and how it's different from, say, logs or metrics is the, the way you approach sampling. So with metrics, it's kind of easy. Everything is aggregated, kind of relatively cheap to store. So we don't bother with sampling there. And with logs, I guess the whole point of logs is that you have 100% of the logs for a certain period of time so that you can find that specific request or, or that specific transaction. But with traces, it gets kind of prohibitively like expensive to store 100% of the data unless there are some specific use cases. So you kind of need to sample data as in retain only certain percentage of, of, of traces. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question is, how do I pick up that certain percentage? If I just pick arbitrary traces, will that be valuable? Or um, can I do better? Can I be more deliberate into, in what kind of traces are really interesting to me and what kind of traces are not as important? And so um, this more sophisticated sampling, I guess there are many different names, smart sampling or whatever, but point is you have to have granular control over your sampling so that you can get better value out of the um, number of traces that you retain and, and ultimately pay. And by the way, it's another good mm -hmm. question, like whether you pay for the number of traces or data or some other things. But Refinery is, is uh, the tool that you folks um, um, open sourced or wrote um, right on. that enables you to have that granular control over your sampling rules. So you can be very specific and say, okay, if my trace had these attributes, then I, I, I want to retain a certain amount of those. And if, if it's less of an important trace, for, exa for example, that represents a request that um, a successful request, uh, really short, like why would I store millions of those? I can just filter them out right. and, and uh, use my event quota for some more useful stuff. So to me, uh, uh, this kind of sophisticated sampling is, is a must have thing. Uh, because it's really hard at certain scale, it's really hard to retain just a certain percentage and then be um, fully happy with the results. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's why we use the refinery to kind of solve this problem. Yeah, I, I find, you know, in been a honeycomb for, I've been a honeycomb for a while. So I've seen a lot of, you know, folks doing different tracing projects and uh, it, it is not uncommon to see folks just doing one out of 10,000 random sampling. And what I've seen is that um, they, they create these pillars of observability that we all like to hear about, but the tracing becomes sort of a last resort of, I found the thing in the log and I went here and, oh, if it, the trace isn't there then engineers don't rely on them as much. And it seems like that smart sampling idea that you're doing is probably increases the, the reliability of that telemetry. Would you, would you, would you say that? Yeah, um, the ability to be precise in, in, in um, the sampling rules uh, opens up various different use cases. For example, we, we have a use case where we configured our sampling rules to retain 100% of the data that comes from our production console. So whenever engineer interacts with a console to maybe query some data and investigate some issue, we retain 100% of those traces. And it's not a lot of data because those interactions are quite rare. But point is that retaining 100% of the type of data, we, we have full audit of anything that folks do in the console. Mm -hmm. And then some of the interesting um, um, results out of it is that uh, sometimes folks do something and they say, hey, I did this and this and I got these results and they share the code that they ran and maybe the output, but they also share a trace. And this kind of helps them to internalize this trace and mental model. So they, um, they exchange uh, information in a form of a trace. So this is really cool. So 
having this precise control over sampling is uh, really valuable because you can uh, you can be very specific and support some interesting use cases. Oh, and you mentioned people sharing traces and using them as ways to communicate. Yeah. And that, uh, and, and then you measured that, right? Uh, well, uh, we, 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 we measure slightly um, more generic thing as in um, uh, we, whenever someone posts a comment on GitHub, so we use GitHub for a very, for issue tracking and um, whenever someone posts a comment with a link to Honeycomb or just mentions Honeycomb, I have a script that I, I, I ran every month and just count the number of comments or issues or pull requests where uh, traces were mentioned or honeycomb was mentioned and um, this is an interesting way to measure adoption it's indirect but uh, the assumption is if someone did something in an, an observability tool and they found it's that valuable so much so that they even shared this with your colleagues so i guess that brought some value right so if we um so honeycomb provides this active user chart which is great so it shows how many people are in, interacting with the tool but uh, you, you, you kind of, you can hardly know, like, did they just clicked on a query that, um, like, did they find it valuable? But measuring this adoption through uh, how frequently folks share those insights kind of gives a better idea of how useful the insights are. That's an interesting way to measure things. Um, yeah. Uh, do you find that, um, do, do, uh, are, are people also sharing, I don't know if you use Slack or Teams or something else, are they also sharing that in the course of their day? Or, hey, here's a link, can you check this out or can you help me out? Is that, do you also find that, that they're doing that versus just you know updating GitHub issues? Yeah, oh, of course. So uh, people exchange um, insights in Slack a lot. And um, I actually wanted to count that as well. However, there are some privacy rules that would not allow me to uh, query Slack uh, private chats, uh, unless I'm part of those, uh, uh, sorry, threads, uh, not threads, but channels, sorry. So unless I'm, uh, unless I'm part of every single private channel in our Slack organization, I won't be able to query those. And so, yeah, I couldn't do this, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but it, it is important to drive engagement through various different channels. And uh, we have observability channel in Slack where uh, whenever someone have, has a question, anything observability related, I kind of specifically point them to that channel. Please ask the question there so that everyone can see and learn from whatever you, uh, whatever the problem you have. So yeah, it's, it's really important to use all the channels, all the communication channels you have to help with the adoption. Yeah, that's kind of, uh, that's, that's really cool. Yes, you can't do analytics on everything. Um, earlier, when you know you, we had a couple of honeycomb screens up and you were talking about sometimes i just want to know a basic count sometimes i want to dig into a trace sometimes i want to see a distribution in a heat map or whatever um you know in you observing how people use honeycomb at intercom is there certain things that they gravitate towards are they are they getting the idea that using analytics to ask questions is is really helpful or are they looking at raw data given give the everybody a sense of kind of where they gravitate towards and and maybe what things you like best hmm. if you know right <laughs> yeah i think uh, folks like the trace view a lot and mm -hmm. um i think uh trace view is helpful because it helps you to bridge this gap between the code that you have and the way that code is, or like the transaction that was processed by that code is represented in terms of spans in this hierarchical structure. So I think it's uh, easy for them to um, understand what's going on. Like, so I have this code and I like, it has some hierarchy inside that code because there's some top level um, procedures or functions. And then there's some low level stuff. And then you can see that projection in the form of a trace. So I think uh, trace view is a good entry point for folks to start getting familiar with the um, with the trace and telemetry. Um, and I, I guess the, the the challenge is to 
make observability practices as part of the operations so that it's not just when something breaks, but you rather use it every single day to answer some basic questions about production. Um, like, um, does anyone use my feature? Or uh, what's the query rate on this specific endpoint? So stuff like this. Yeah, I know we, we use it for all sorts of different things. We have the luxury of using honeycomb to honeycomb, honeycomb with. Um, but uh, do we also, we use SLOs pretty heavily at honeycomb. Is that something that intercom uses now or is thinking about or, or, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, so if you remember that workflow, uh, uh, which we st started with our webinar where folks receive an alarm in one tool, then they go to a dashboard in the other tool, and then they go to some other tools to do the investigation. It, it's very important to, for the, um, like whenever you have a workflow, uh, observability workflow, it's important mm -hmm. for the entry point to be as close to the data that will help you to investigate it fully as possible. In that respect, it's really important to use um, trace and telemetry as a, 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 as a trigger for your alarms. And we kind of only started transitioning to use SLOs and triggers, but it's a massive opportunity for us in terms of adoption, because if we start pointing folks towards the right tooling, right from the alarm, mm -hmm. or better, alarm itself is part of the tooling that we want them to use to be productive. Then it really helps to minimize those hops between the tools and ultimately make the workflow smooth. So yeah, it's something we are actively looking into, but um, haven't fully um, adopted yet. Yeah, we're seeing that, you know, that concept of service level objectives, you know, like sometimes, uh, and a lot of this comes out of Google's SRE practices that um, folks will often use it for, you know, to, to get an idea of, hey, when should I make my system more reliable versus shipping features? But we're also seeing folks um, use it to set goals on their service for uptime. Um, and at the same time, you know, as Honeycomb users, they're able to see that they're doing pretty well, they're meeting their goals, but there are always some folks that might not be having a desirable, you know, the greatest experience, like some latency because they're on a different, they don't have the cool iPhone 4, uh, 14 yet, or maybe they're somewhere else in the world. Do you, um, Intercom, in all the discussions that I've had with Intercom, there's kind of a saying around that we are obsessed with customer service, like probably better than most. Um, you know, how do you see your customers in the telemetry that you use? Are you able to kind of, um, you know, get an idea of what's happening there as well? Yeah, so um, as we grew over the last few years, we start to get more of those customers who are really massive. So they have hundreds and hundreds of people using Intercom uh, eight hours per day and for business critical um, tasks. So we, we really wanna make sure that the experience for those folks is good, right? And um, so this, this is kind of where the business needs um, dictating the, uh, the requirements for observability. Like you absolutely have to be able to uh, assess customer impact, for, customer impact for this specific customer whenever they have in a bad day. Or maybe you have um, uh, an incident, right? And you wanna really know how that incident impacted that specific customer at that point in time. So uh, we, we made a good effort to make sure that every single trace that we produce has a tag uh, that represents our cust uh, customer ID, basically. So um, that really helps to attribute every single piece of work we do or our infrastructure does to, uh, to a specific customer that that work was done for. And an inter interesting um, result of this was that uh, because we have everything auto-instrumented, right? And we know exactly uh, which customer this specific uh, work was done for, um, we can basically put a price tag on every single transaction we serve because we also know the uh, cost of all the cloud resources that we use. So an interesting outcome is that tracing data now is um, crucial for Coast program because we, mm. uh, we, we can be very precise in assessing uh, the cost of um, serve, cost of serve for, for every single customer. So that, that's an interesting kind of 
that sounds like a future upcoming blog post on intercom engineering on how to properly measure the cost of things. We do a lot of that cost measurement as some folks have seen our, our, our work with Amazon, but I'm sure aside from this situation that we're talking about today, people could use advice on that. You know, Kesha, I really like your shirt and uh, folks that are on the webinar or watching it because this is recorded um, can grab one of those cool I test and prod shirts that will probably make your executives look at you like, what? What's that about? Um, we're going to post a survey link uh, in the Zoom chat in a sec. Uh, if you want to even pull out your phone and QR code uh, the survey, um, everyone that that gets a, that does that um, gets a t-shirt. And of course, Honeycomb's happy to share a cool swag with everybody else. So click on that if you can. And I've been the one who's, you know, Jess and I have been the ones that have been asking you some questions, uh, Kesha, and thank you so much for um, answering them with such detail. Folks that are in the participants list on there, if you'd like, you can type things in the chat. We got one uh, from Raf, but you can also um, take yourself off of mute after I ask Raf's question. You can put on your camera. You can talk to Kesha directly. This is not just a regular There's webinar. There's one from it's Nick too. Yeah. Uh, Raf Estrada says, hey, can you tell us about how Intercom uses Honeycomb outside of the main monolith? Is there something outside the main monolith? Uh, well, so we have this front end application, which is also a monolith, mm -hmm. but um, it's kind of a separate uh, repository. And we, we, at the moment, we're trying to instrument it with tracing as well. Uh, we also have um, side applications. And I, I guess the, the kind of a problem or more of a challenge for us is that we invest a lot in the monolith, right? So we make uh, every single kind of process within the monolith as effective as possible for the product engineers, whether it's about observability or uh, dealing with background jobs or various different common blocks, we have everything ready in the monolith for you to be productive. And um, on the other hand, other side applications don't have this kind of level of support. Uh, but still, um, with open telemetry and uh, this high quality auto instrumentation that open telemetry provides, we, we can kind of relatively easily bridge, that, bridge this gap because it's just a matter of adding a few libraries in your application, and then you get some traces out of the box. Um, so that's kind of the, the strategy. We keep investing in the monolith, uh, but we also, we don't leave other applications kind of with nothing. We, we're trying to help there as well and, and um, uh, use open telemetry to, to get some low hanging fruits. Awesome. Anybody else wants to take themselves off mute, ask questions. We got a few minutes before we uh, wrap up and tell you what's happening next with Honeycomb. There was one from Nick a while ago. He wanted to know if people uh, link to Honeycomb in Jira tickets. Uh, well, we, we don't use Jira for uh, development workflows. So we, we just use GitHub. So, mm. and that's what we measure on those charts. So I guess, um, yeah, that, that, that's our main tool for, uh, for everything. Uh, okay. So you're looking at not only like bugs where people are, linking, this is slow, this is the problem, but also um, you, you mentioned, is my feature used? Um, the other insights that they got into production behavior related to changes? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's not just bugs. So literally any, any piece of communication that they post in GitHub, uh, we kind of parse that and uh, see if whether they shared uh, anything tra tracing related there. And if they did, we count that as a as an insight shared, so we we take a box, we, we count that in. Love it. Uh, all right. Anything else? We'll give a couple more seconds for last questions as we have taken a great deal of Kesha's time and he probably has some real work to do. Um, there are some things coming up. Honeycomb is always good stuff we're working on and things that we're hosting. I'm going to hopefully get over to Ireland and hang out with you all at Intercom. But 
let's go here. Um, check out the workshops that we have at Honeycomb. Um, they, we, we have observability workshops, um, things like how to learn about service level objectives and how to use the query builder. And these are all available for everyone out there. Um, these are the ones that are coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, if you hit our website, you'll, you'll see all of them. And uh, Bethany posted a link down there as well. Um, always good content from well, not only the intercom engineering blogs, I personally love um, software engineering team blogs because they generally share things, but well, they share successes, but they also share tips. And um, we've got a lot of great content at Honeycomb. Want to check to see if there's any more questions. I think we're pretty good. And wanted to oh. thank, oh, was it, you got- I, I want to oh. give a shout out Go for it. To um, if you're if you're using Open Telemetry or starting to use Open Telemetry, um, there's a lot there, and there's a lot of like various challenges. And so, so we have like um, a meetup. It's supported by Honeycomb, but it's a it's a vendor neutral meetup about Open Telemetry and a newsletter, a monthly newsletter. If you want to go to OpenTelemetryInPractice.net, um, recommend. If 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 you're like here today um, and you think the website is bad, that was me, definitely a backend developer. But if you're watching this recording, it might be good by the time you click there. Either way, it'll link you to the meetup in the newsletter. Thanks. Awesome. That's great. So you, so you have a, so you've got some to-dos, I guess, right? Awesome. Anyways, um, thank you everyone uh, who's watching the recording. If you made it this far, and it's after the survey, send an email to us or chat with us on the intercom messenger on honeycomb.io and I will make sure you get a t-shirt. Uh, thanks to all the participants. Special thanks to uh, our good friend, Kesha. And of course, as always, Jessitron. Thank you so much. Everyone have a fantastic day. And, uh, thanks, Kesha. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, folks. Awesome. Let's go. Thanks. <laughs>